morning and happy Tuesday. Uh, today I have what I think is a highly requested video. People seem to ask me all the time what I'm doing during my small group reading time and not just what I'm doing during that time, but what the other kids are doing. So today I kind of wanted to walk you through what literacy time looks like in my classroom. And so we'll talk about phonics, we'll talk about Hegarty, and then we will talk about that uh, reading time that we have specifically. So I just wanted to walk you through what that's going to look like, uh, and I'll give you a few examples of what we have done. The easiest way to do that is going to be to start with the schedule. So just to get a full understanding of um, how our schedule works, for literacy, we have 10 minutes of Hegarty and then 30 minutes of phonics, and that is right after our morning meeting. So right there, we have 40 minutes of phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and then explicit phonics instruction. Then we go into snack and recess, and then we have our reading block. Now, our reading block is from 10 to 10.50, and it's split up in two different parts. Uh, and then, which I'll explain to you. And then when, of course, is what I need, which is also where I meet with some small groups. So let me kind of go over how that works. Hegarty is already a curriculum. So if you are not familiar, it takes about 10 minutes. I basically just walk through the actual manual. I keep mine over here in the back of my easel with foundations. Um, so this is what Hegarty looks like. We are on week nine. Um, but if you don't have Hegarty, you could just do 10 minutes of phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and then we go into our explicit phonics instruction. Now we use foundations. I largely use foundations as it is. I do have some other slides that I will sometimes um, supplement with. For example, we are starting unit four and we have the floss rule. Let me see if I can open it. So here's just an example of some of these slides. I have shared these in the past for what I do when I'm introducing letter sounds and digraphs and brand new concepts. So for the floss rule, we of course are looking at those double letters. So I want students to see what they notice about these letters first. Uh, and then we will go over then we will go over how the floss rule is a one 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 rule. We'll give some examples. Um, see if we can come up with any other words where the floss rule applies. And then here students will come up and try to highlight words that need to double their last letter. So this is just an introductory lesson. I also have on the slides, I went ahead and made them kind of align with foundations. So we will go over this, what the one one rule is, how we need to double it, how we mark it with that extra star. Uh, give some examples here. We go over yes and bus and how those are exceptions to the rule. Sub does not need it, and we'll talk about why. It does not end in one of those last letters. Buzz does need it. We'll go into our student notebook and add the word miss, and then we will practice some dictation. So that is what foundations or phonics looks like today. But again, if you don't use foundations, about 30 minutes of structured and systematic phonics instruction is necessary. So after phonics, we go to snack and recess. Um, we have our recess first, so students usually go outside unless it's like pouring or way too cold. Um, and then we will come back inside, we will put on storyline online, watch a story while we eat, and then it goes right into our reading time. So I told you reading time is from 10 to 10.50, but 10 to 10.20 is our read aloud. It's our interactive read aloud time where I'm choosing a story, I am teaching explicit uh, vocabulary, I usually have some sort of goal that I want them to do during that interactive read aloud time, and then from 10.20 to 10, no, yeah, 10.20 to 10.50, that is two 15 minute blocks for me to have reading groups. So let's show you what that looks like. I'm back over to the slides. We are reading Clark the Shark. So yesterday we read Clark the Shark and we practiced retelling. Um, and the vocabulary I used, I have my little book bunches. I'll go ahead and link them down in the description. But they're just like 15 page mini units for a bunch of my favorite books. So here's the vocabulary that came from that. So I explicitly taught what each word means. Uh, we pointed it out in the story when we got to it. And then yesterday, like I said, we practiced retelling. So I had a little retelling sheet that we could use um, to practice with. Today, we're gonna practice making some connections. Uh, we're gonna read this story again, and we're going to think about self-control, because that's what Clark the Shark is working on. So we're gonna talk about self-control, when we can show self-control, and that will be kind of our 20 minute block, right? I will review the vocabulary. We will reread the story again. Also, when I do review this vocabulary today, I'm looking for students to use these words in a sentence. Um, so I'm gonna give them some yes or no examples of the word. They'll give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. 
Uh, I will read it, the story again, then I'll ask them to try to use one of these words in a sentence. I ask them who can be brave and try it out. We will make some connections. We'll just do this whole group. You know, when is a time where you really need to show control? When is a time where self-control might be hard for you? And we'll kind of ask those questions. And then we go to our slide. So this is where uh, 1020 starts. So this will be the next half an hour just to kind of show you what this looks like. And this is really how I have my students be independent while I'm working with groups. So first of all, the first thing students are always going to do is respond to the text in some sort of way. So again, this is from my little book bunch unit. Um, look at the pictures below, color in the ones that show self-control. When you're done, share your answers with a partner. So we will go over what each picture looks like uh, before I send them off and what's going on in each picture, and they will have to color in the ones that show self-control. As soon as they finish that, they will put it in the turn it in bin, which they know how to do, um, and then they will go right to their next job, which is they will grab their iPad and they will go on to Seesaw. So in Seesaw, we have read and match. These are new that I added to the Literacy Club this past month um, for all sorts of different skills. So students will have to read the word and simply drag over the picture that matches. And there's a couple pages in there for them to complete. When they complete the response to reading and when they complete the pages in Seesaw, they can go to Raz Kids where I made an assignment for them. Now over on the right hand side, you will see a 10 minute timer as well as uh, there's four students names there who are obviously blocked out, but that is my first group I am meeting with. Now obviously I do have uh, two 15 minute blocks during this time, uh, but we are just not there yet. 10 minutes team seems to be perfect. And then I plan to bump it up to 12 minutes when we don't have as much transition time. Um, so then this first group will come back to me and then the next slide, let me see if I can show you the next slide. You can't even tell because it's the same exact slide. Basically once that timer goes off, um, this is another slide with four new students names and they come back to me for an additional 10 minutes. So by doing two 10 minute groups, uh, which will eventually bump up to 12 minutes, it gives me a little wiggle room in terms of transition time and also helping any student that kind of needs it. But by this point in the year, it is. Tuesday, November 7th. Uh, we are very independent with this, which I enjoy. Just to give you some other examples, I think I've shared this in my last couple of videos, but for the last two weeks before we got to this week, um, I had been reading during that read aloud time, I've been reading the Little Spot of Emotions books. So we kind of went through the whole series. We even made this little bulletin board, which I loved. Um, but during that time, the reading center time, I told you the first station is always going to be a respond to the text in some sort of way. Um, so it could be just a retelling sheet. It could be a very generic one. It doesn't have to go with the book specifically, um, but it needs to go with whatever skill you're teaching. So if I'm teaching my students, I want you to retell this in order. I'm going to give them a retelling sheet to respond to that story. If I'm talking about making connections with the characters or uh, character details, whatever I'm teaching, they will have to, again, apply it to the story that I just read aloud. Just to show you this other freebie that I had, which I loved, it's for the little spots of emotion. So like I said, we read one each day. Um, the goal was always to make connections to the text and think of a time when we felt that emotion. So let me show you, I made these little mini books here. Uh, I need to hide this friend's name and then I can show you kind of how we responded every day. So first they just had a little cover that they could go ahead and fill in. And then each day, the first one we read was loved. And so it said, I feel blank when people play with me. And this one was loved. And then they had to color in the dot, the little spot to match. I feel angry when my sister takes my toys. I feel peaceful when I meditate. <laughs> I feel anxious when I was in pre-K and I had to do after school, yeah. I feel sad because my dog died. I feel happy when my brother plays with me. I feel confident when I am accurate. And I feel mixed up when it was my first day of school. So the mixed up scribble spot was a bunch of different emotions that we try to sort out. Basically during this time right here, every day there was just a screenshot um, of the page that they're going to do. And I wrote down the word that they would write in. So if we learned about loved, it would say loved right here with their page and they would go to their booklet. So again, we kind of follow the same exact type of schedule every single day um, just to build that consistency, build that structure in and students know what to do. Um, again, I like it because we're responding to the text. They do something independent. This is always on Seesaw. And then either they go to Raz Kids or they go to Epic afterwards. Um, and then I meet with my two groups. 
As for what I am doing with my two groups, I explained in an older video what my small group reading lessons look like. Um, these were given to us by the district and they were also, uh, I did a training for two days to kind of understand exactly how they want us to give this small group literacy instruction. It's fully based on the science of reading. And I think I told you all of the books already came with lessons, which is great. So here is how I store them. Let me show you. Right now I have them stored in folders. And then here is the kind of scope and sequence with the grade one alignment in terms of what we're teaching in foundations and what decodables go with it. So let's pretend we were on unit one or let's pretend my students are just working on, you know, CBC words in general. So I might pull week two. This is the uh, book sit mat. I find it here. Open it up. Here is the decodable. Here is the lesson in order, the exact lesson of how I will teach it. And then here are all the grids and everything we need to go over. So I'm not going to go into full detail on how I do this because I did that in that other video. I will link it down below. Um, but essentially you walk through each step. I will not get through a full lesson in, you know, 10 to 12 minutes. These are meant to be split up over two days. So wherever we stop at this point, I will give students their book. They will go ahead and put this in their book bin. And then when they meet with me the next day, they come on over. Now, I also just want to grab a book bin real quick because as soon as students see their name up on the board and they know that they are coming to me, they will grab their book bin and they will just come right to the table and they start reading their fluency folder right away. I like this because they have, uh, you know, a routine that they know to do. So they are doing something as soon as they get back to the table and they're not just waiting for me to start instruction. Um, so in their fluency folder, they all have different things. But here the student has blending lines for CVC with the letter A, blending lines with CVC E, O. So they'll kind of start at the beginning. They have a little witch finger that they can use and read all the words quickly and accurately. And then we also just added our first decodable poem, Josh's Fish. So yesterday we highlighted all the SH words, we read it through once, and we're gonna read this again together. So sometimes we do a little fluency folder work as a warm up before we head into the lesson. Now, other times I should point out that sometimes we are doing just a skills based lesson. So I will definitely do those small group reading lessons. Um, but then sometimes during win or during like a Friday, I will pull them over and we'll do something more specific, maybe like a phoneme graphy mapping, depending on where they're at. So this is the CBC board. So I will give students this, they'll get their little boat here. They will get some cubes and then I have picture cards. Let me pull them out. So we'll do a couple together, but essentially I will go ahead and pull a picture. Net, we'll tap it, n et. We put cubes, n et. And then they take their marker and map it. So N E T. And then when we check it, grab their boat and they read it. Net, net, net. Erase it all, clear the board. Let's do another one. Bin, b, i, n, cube, 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 b, i, n, read, read, read. And I have the same thing over here for uh, digraphs that we've been doing as well. This is also where I store all of my sand for our three-part drill that we do. We do sand on Fridays. And then also my literacy coach is amazing. She built these little buckets for us just to have some extra fun stuff um, to go along with the lessons. So every day, Monday through Friday, I am meeting with the same two groups during that time. Now, those are my lowest groups. Those are my groups that are going to win. And so I don't get to see them during win. So they really need that double dose of literacy instruction, phonics instruction. So they meet with me for 10 minutes. We do a decodable and or some sort of skill strategy group. They go to win. Uh, and then they come back. So my two higher groups I meet with during win time. Now, this is a good time to point out that I only have 17 students in my class um, and one student isn't in here full time. That student kind of pops back and forth. I do meet with that student at least once a week to work on skills that that student is specifically working on. Um, so realistically, I have four groups of four that I am able to see uh, throughout the week. So again, eight students I'm seeing every single day, Monday through Friday. And then my other two groups, my two higher groups, one of them I see um, two days a week and the other I see three days a week during that wind time. Now that's like planned in because my wind time's pretty long. So those are like my planned reading groups. We are doing the same types of instruction, but we're doing it at their level. Um, but that's not, that doesn't mean that's the only time I see them. I will also pull them and do other things. Um, in fact, my highest group, I've been pulling books from reading A to Z and I've been giving them their own separate assignments that they kind of go off and do. And they check in with me every single day since I only meet with them for two structured periods 
um, during the week. Believe me, I have taught uh, up to 26 first graders at one time, so I know that this is not possible. This is very much like a wonderful dream. It's very uh, ideal that I get to meet with all of these students every single day. That is something I'm very appreciative of, but I do want to point that out when you are thinking about how to schedule your own students for this time. So last but not least, let me show you when. I know I've shared this before, but I'll show you my win slides and I will explain um, how I meet with my students during that time. So for win time, we always have four separate groups. Um, we have independent review, which is going to be this blue bin at the top. Um, and this is going to be review of skills either taught this week or previously. So this week we have say, tap, and write with digraphs. So sh, i, p, and they have to phoneme, grapheme, map it. Here we have visual discrimination. They have to really look at every single word uh, and color in the correct one. And then we have some subtraction practice. So students will go ahead and complete that on their own when their name is there. For independent writing, I am loving this. I have been giving students a SciShow Kids in uh, Seesaw that's assigned to them, and they will go ahead and watch the video. So we talked about emotions all for the last couple of weeks. So they watched Why We Get Mad, and then they will grab their little writing prompt here. I get mad when, and they will take it over and they will complete it in their journal. So in their foundations journal, it is just filled with fun prompts that connect to something that they're reading or watching. Next in win, they always have a collaborative math game. So this is something that they are doing with a partner. The other two have been independent so far. We are diving into shapes this week. So here are our pattern blocks. They have a bunch of pattern block challenges um, that students can go ahead and fill out. And I have actually two trays of these down below. So when they're with a partner, they can just pull one tray. And then last but not least, we have collaborative reading. And here students are getting together with their book bins in their fluency folders, and they will sit and read the books together for a good 10 to 15 minutes. So here is everybody's name in their win station. These stations stay the same the entire uh, week. So I really kind of go over them briefly every single day about what they should be doing. And then every day they look for their name. And then again, to foster that independence after they go ahead and complete their station, they know what they can do down on the bottom. So this group can go to Kings and Queens. This group can go to IXL. Um, this group can go to some handwriting practice and this group can go to Epic. The entire win block goes from 10.50 to 11.30, essentially about 40 minutes. Um, so during that time, many of my students actually leave the classroom and they go off to their win groups, whether it's extra reading support or extra math support, and everybody else stays back with me. They independently work on that. And throughout the week during that time, I am pulling my two higher groups. Three days a week, I pull one of them and two days a week, I pull the other one because then during that additional kind of 20 minutes, I'm either pulling students one-on-one, -on -one, I might be pulling students to practice some math skills that they need. Um, because while I am very, you know, literacy focused, I want to make sure that we are not losing track of math as well. So during that win block, I'm really trying to remember it is what I need uh, based on those students' specific skills. And so we're a little flexible during that time, which is great. So there you have my small group literacy. That is how it's been working in my classroom for the last few months. I know people had asked like a month or two ago and I wanted to give it a little more time. This has been pretty seamless and I'm very excited about it. Um, throughout the year, what I like is we can build up that response to reading. We can build up what they're doing independently, but then I always have some sort of seesaw activity that they go into. So it's boom, respond to literature, uh, go ahead and do some sort of seesaw. It is always literacy focused because it's literacy time. So it's always phonics related, usually based on the skills or patterns that I'm teaching currently, like those uh, floss rule words. Um, so that was read and match. I do have other ones where I have say, build, and write. They look like this over in Seesaw. All sorts of different skills. Sometimes I just search the Seesaw library and see what they have. But typically it is going to work on something that uh, we are currently learning. And then they can go ahead and read independently, either on Epic or on Raz Kids. From time to time, I do allow students to just read from their book bins with their decodable books. But I like Epic and Raz Kids because they can really access some uh, real authentic text that can be read to them. So it's kind of like the alternative to the old read to self where students may not have been able to read those picture books, but now they can listen to them and it's a great time for them to do that. I really hope this video was helpful to you. If you have any questions about how I do this or anything you want me to clarify, please go ahead and drop them down below. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.